Well, today uh, I want to talk about something about fatherhood. The title for today's sermon is The Father's Heart, Unconditional Love and Grace. Well, I was doing some research, you know, preparing the Father's Day, you know, message, and I came across a very interesting statistics. It says here that, you know, a, um, there's a Mother's Day and Father's Day, and out of, out of 525 participants, 93, almost 94% with the roundup of people, they celebrate Mother's Day, but only 84% percent of the people, they celebrate Father's Day. Not only that, you know, when you buy uh, uh, gifts for mothers and fathers, the amount they're spending. On Mother's Day, $21 billion, but only $13 billion for the fathers. And the number doesn't, re uh, doesn't uh, present just one year. There's a trend Consistently, people spend a lot more money for mothers and way less money <laughs> for the fathers. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not fair. I mean, sometimes I feel like, are we really not, you know, valuing and, and, and appreciating what fathers do? I mean, I, as I was doing some study, I came across this a TV show called I'm Maori. And I don't really watch the TV show. I just stumble upon this TV show. And interestingly, what they were doing, there's a segment called, Is He the Father? <laughs> <laughs> and when the question was being answered, and when they say, You are not the Father, I saw people, these people dancing, celebrating. And I believe that this TV show, the people like, you know, being aired here, they, they don't represent, you know, the most people. But, you know, I, it just bothers me that being a father, it becomes a source of entertainment. It's, it's something that people don't really want to have in their life. Because I know a lot of fathers, when they hear, you are the father. Yeah, he's my baby. She's my girl. But then on the other hand, it's something that this world is as entertainment, like giving us distraction. And as a matter of fact, the, the, the single motherhood in, in, in this nation has been only increasing throughout the years. Like man should have the sense of responsibility when you bring life to this place and I'm, I, I believe that I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. But at the same time, as we are celebrating the Father's Day weekend, I thought it would be meaningful for us to remind ourselves what are the God's purpose and plans for us being a man and being a father. What is the definition of father and a husband? One of my favorite authors wrote this here. It says, The work of making home happy does not rest upon the mother alone. Fathers have an important part to act. The husband is the husband of the home treasures, binding by his strong, earnest, devoted affection the members of the household mother and children together in the strongest bonds of union, his name, house band, is the true definition of husband. I saw that, but few fathers realized their responsibility. So being a father is a God-given responsibility. It's divine responsibility. Psalm 103 verse 13, it says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. You know, the father's job is, it, it doesn't end uh, uh, at, 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 at winning the bread. When I went back to Korea years ago, and I, I was having dinner with my family, and I saw a, a, a young family eating together. It was a dad and, and a mom and then two, two kids. 
And during the entire time, the mom was trying to feed the kid and everything. And I saw the father, and he was out here playing uh, the games on his cell phone. And then, and then when kids were acting up, and then the mom got frustrated, so she yelled at them. And the dad was like, what, what is going on? And, 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 and that was the kind of phenomenon that was happening in Korea. So there's some uh, the, uh, TV shows actually diagnosing the problems, modern family and everything. And they say that, you know, father's job doesn't end at winning the bread. They think that they've done their job by earning money and bring the money to their wives. So everything else, it's up to you. So my job is here. I took you, I take you to the restaurant. So now I'm playing the video games. And, and the wives are the ones doing that. But it is not what it's supposed to be. So if you are worthy enough to have a child or children, there are five things to make a great father. So we're going to just, just, there are many other points, but we're going to do five points today. Number one. Father should be a protector. It says here, the head of the family from the husband and father is the head of the household. The wife looks to him for love and sympathy and for aid in the training of the children. And this is right. The children are his as well as hers, and he is equally interested in their welfare. The children Look to the father for support and guidance. He needs to have a right conception of life and of the influences and associations that should surround his family. Above all, he should be controlled by the love and fear of God and by the teaching of his word, that he may guide the feet of his children in the right way. The father should do his part toward making them happy. Whatever his cares and business perplexities, they should not be permitted to overshadow his family. He should enter his home with smiles and pleasant word. A father is naturally a protective. He truly cares about your well-being. It is his job to make sure you are safe and taken care of because he's responsible for everything related to the family. He should entrust it, his family to God, seeking protection from any dangers, fraud, troubles, or stress that might come their way. And, the, and there are certain things that fathers protect you from, which you may never even notice, because they face those challenges first. If I'm a leader, I experience troubles before anyone else does. Anything or anyone behind me doesn't feel the full force of the difficulties because I am standing in their way. So this is what the husband, the men are going through as a leader of the family, as a man in the family, and a lot of times they are those things that that that, that husband and the fathers do may get overlooked. So here's the challenge of being a father. Many people fall to recognize your value until you are no longer around. Then the full impact hits the wife. It's possible that you might feel unappreciated by your family because you are shielding them from the hardships. Genuine men, true father, don't come home and constantly complain or whine about everything because some of the protection lies in your silence. Number two, the father should be a provider. When I talk about a provider, it's, not, it's, it's more than just the money. He provides wisdom, friendship, counsel. He provides perspective. He provides insight. He has a given, he has a giving spirit. 
He adds to your life. Your life is fuller and richer because He is in it. It is not necessarily an issue over who makes most money. He is still a provider. He may not make as, make as much as you make, but He is in there stretching all He can. He is a provider. He is a contributor. He is a giver. And I'm not saying buying things to wife. I'm talking about father with his DNA to be a provider. He provides things for the family first, then what he wants to buy. Number three, the father should be a promoter. Somebody who promotes other than themselves. It is not about getting a whole family to make you look good. It is about using the fits that God has given you to them look good. Being a father is not about you, but it, it is about your children. Enemy is not fighting over you. You're 30s and 40. You're already, your life is already messed up. You're already dysfunctional. But it's your kid. The only reason the devil is messing with you at all is so that you will do something stupid enough to mess up your kid so that the generation curse will pass from one to the other. That's why you get to resist the devil and say, just because my dad made a mistake, it doesn't mean that I'm alive under the influence and the trauma. I'm going to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. It says here, remember your own childhood. Do not treat your children only with sternness, forgetting your own childhood and forgetting that they are but children. Do not expect them to be perfect or try to make them men and women in their acts at once. By so doing, you will close the door of access which you might otherwise have to them and will drive them to open the door for injurious influences, for others to poison their young minds before you awake to their danger. Parents should not forget their childhood years, how much they yearned for sympathy and love, and how unhappy they felt with, when censured and fretfully chided. They should be young again in their feelings and bring their minds down to understand the wants of their children. They need gentle, encouraging words. Parents, give your children love, love in babyhood, love in childhood, love in youth. Do not give them fronts, but ever keep a sunshiny countenance. You know, when I was little, my parents were very, very strict like I mentioned you about like all the pow pows that happen and pow pow the word pow pow is a really un is understatement it's a very understatement <laughs> and I told my mom if I ever have a kid I will never beat them and my mom said until wait until you have your own kid My mom told me, you know, when I was growing up, my, my, my mom beat me and I said I would never be my child. And then when you came along, it was impossible. <laughs> I mean, my friend told me, like, because I don't have any kids, so I may not understand what all the fathers and mothers are going through. And one of my friends, like, he never, like, raised his voice. I never seen him getting angry. But he has two boys. And when he came to my house, I asked him about, like, how things are going, how's your kid and everything. And he told me, like, I never knew that I had that kind of face in me. Like, when my boys were misbehaving, I, I never knew that I could get that 
much angry and mad at them. I even like gave them some good pow pows. And I was like, you? Wow, I, w- I would never have seen that in you. And so it's a challenging. So it's kind of something that we mind ourselves every, every day, what we just read. Like remember your childhood. Number four, as a father, father should be a priest of a house. The father will bind his children to the throne of God by living faith, distrusting his own strength, He hangs his helpless soul on Jesus and takes hold of the strength of the Most High. Brethren, pray at home, in your family, night and morning. Pray earnestly in your closet. And while engaged in your daily labor, lift up the soul to God in prayer. Why? Because being a parent is very, very challenging. Being a father is a very, very challenging. So he says, we have to pray. We have to lean on God. It was thus that Enoch walked with God. The silent, fervent prayer of the soul will rise like holy incense to the throne of grace and will be as acceptable to God as if offered in the sanctuary. To all who thus seek him, Christ becomes a present help in time of need. They will be strong in the day of trial. We see many patriarchs like, like, like Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac in the, in the Bible. And when, when Noah and his family landed after the flood, he built an altar before they built even uh, uh, their, uh, even before they built their houses. Because he is a priest, and as a man, he needs, he needed a prayer life. Man should be a praying man. You can just, just, you, you can just come to church. No, you have to have a prayer life. Why today, like, there are not that many men doing what men are supposed to do? I think it's because we're losing God in this culture. Men are, men are not praying enough. When, when we turn your problem over to God, you will crack, you will break, you will flip out, you will lose control. But you have to pass your cares on God. As some people turn it over to you, you have to turn it over to the Lord. Your kids bring you a trouble. Your mama brings you trouble. Your siblings bring you a trouble. Your wife brings you trouble. But you can't hold all of that to yourself. You got to cast it on the Lord And say, Lord, you can take care of this. We need men who knows how to pray. First Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Why God says that they pray without ceasing? Because you have problems coming at you without ceasing. You have to handle everything as they throw everything at you. They come to you with their complaints and you take it all to God and you become the one they vent to and then you bring it before God. If you don't turn it over to God, you will collapse. And that's why you, 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 you start to uh, go back to your old habits like You've been sober for a while, and now you start drinking again. You start smoking again because you are carrying stuffs that you cannot handle. You have to turn it all to the Lord. In this room, there are many men who may believe that their sins are what separate them from the Lord. 
They may think, well, I've done dumb things. I've done some stupid things. This is why I, I am separated from God. But here, here's the thing. Your sins are not the biggest problem because we all make mistakes. We're all sinners. Being a sinner is not something to make you feel like, oh, I'm, I'm so bad. No, that's not the problem. The greatest problem that we have is the lack of prayer. Because the Bible clearly says, if my people, which are called by name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God said, forget about your sins. I will heal your land. My problem with you is that you don't pray. If you pray, God said, he will deal with your weaknesses. You have all your professional careers, busy life, your hobbies, but your highest goal is to be a father. You will be there where your children need you to be. You got a devil to fight. We need some men who can fight the devil. The last point Father, he is a prophet. He speaks word of prophecy to his children. He tells them about their potential, what they can achieve, and what they are capable of doing. You must say to your children, you are capable of so much more than this. You have the ability to go even further. This setback does not define your life. Get back up. And keep fighting. You are a champion. If you, if you don't give up, you will succeed. Fathers need to be like preachers to their kids. Constantly reminding them that they are destined for greatness. And that they will overcome. Proverbs 22 verse 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not Depart from it. Well, there is a story in the book of Genesis chapter 35, verse 17 and 18. It says, Now it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this, you, you will have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, so she died that she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. So this is what is going on. Rachel was in the midst of labor, giving birth to her second child. As she struggled in the final moment of pain, gasping for a breath, she named her baby Ben-Oni. Ben-Oni means son of pain, or son of my misfortune. Sometimes when life hasn't treated us kindly, that bitterness can pass down through how we treat our children. And sadly, Rachel passed away. And now Jacob returned to the tent, and the midwife held the baby, and she was crying and told Jacob that his wife named him Ben-Oni. However, Jacob refused the name, saying, No, he should not be called Ben-Oni. I will name him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Right hand, in Hebrew context, symbolizes happiness and prosperity. He will be the son of my happiness and prosperity. The boy whose mother died while giving birth could have had a life filled with dysfunction. 
However, his life was blessed because his father spoke prophecies over him and declared who he was meant to be. The problem faced by many men in our society today is that they have never had another man lay hands on them and tell them their true identity. In this church, we aim to break the curse and empower men to discover their true selves. So when we come to this church, men, the fathers, we have a job to, to speak prophecies, the potentials of the other young boys and girls, what they are capable of. Our job is not to put down to them, but encourage them, setting the example for them. I came across a story about a father who uh, saved son's life by armed and three-hour hospital standoff. George Pickering the third suffered a massive stroke. The son, George Pickering the third, doctors diagnosed the 27-year-old as brain dead, and the hospital order, ordered his life support removed. It progressively shut off in a fatal procedure they call terminal win. But George is dead. George Sr. felt in his gut that his son could make it. Despite the terminal prognosis, his son just needed more time. And he remembered all the good times, the memories that they shared together. Nevertheless, doctors told the family that George had no hope of recovery. Both George's mother and his brother agreed to take George off life support. Hospital staff even notified an organ do uh, donation organization that George's organs would be available. The father said they were moving too fast. The hospital, the nurses, the doctors, I knew if I had three or four hours that night that I would know whether George was brain dead or not. That's when George Pickering II did something dangerous and illegal, but which saved the life of his son. George Sr. took a gun into Tombo Regional Medical Center, barricaded himself in with his son, with his son and began a three-hour standoff with staffs and police, seeking to give George Jr. more time on life support. Even after he was disarmed, his father remained barricaded in and even threatened staff and officers to buy George time on life support. He was ready to die with his son. The SWAT team had their own doctors, and, and when they entered into the cri a critical care room, they saw that, and this is what his lawyer was saying, my client's son was not brain dead because he was making eye contact and was following their command. They were completely amazed. The family lawyer said this. So after feeling his son's his son show all the signs of life, the hospital staff and officers acknowledging the signs of life, George Sr. surrendered peacefully. Arrested, charged with the assault with a deadly weapon, and convicted, the father happily served nearly a year in jail for his crime. Later on, both of them sat on in front of the camera, and this is what the son says. There was a law bro broken, but it was broken for all the right reasons. I'm here now because of it. It was love. It was love. And when I see Jesus, 
When the Bible talks about how the Father sent His only begotten Son in John 3.16, we may all know this by, our, by heart. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. When the sin came into the Garden of Eden, the law was broken already. All human race, Adam's descendant, should have been perished. That was it. But God could not give up on us. And God says, they need more time. I know this is not the rule that I said, because God and sin, they cannot coexist. But I'm going to send my only begotten son so that Jesus, who had, had this 100% divinity, took this 100% humanity to come to this very inconvenient place. Think about this in heaven. I mean, all the advanced technology and everything, there, there, there should be there. I mean, when I was doing some mission trips, going to a developing countries, and I learned how inconvenient living in certain areas, right? And imagine God coming down to this earth, willing to deal with all the inconvenience, but not only the inconvenience, being mocked, being beaten, tortured, and hung on the cross. Why? Because God loved us so much. So that He's willing to break the law that He set and send His only Son to this place. My brothers, we're not perfect. And all our fathers, we all make mistakes. I don't know if there's anyone who can say as a father, I've never done anything wrong. I've never made any mistakes. I don't know if that person would exist. But as we look at God, who sent His only begotten Son, the unconditional love and grace is something that we need to seek by fervent prayers. So as we continue this journey as a father and husband, now being in the same journey with God, walking with Him every day by day, now the Calvary, when Calvary becomes personal to you. Now you're going to have this testimony. Thanks to Calvary, I am not the man that I used to be. Thanks to Calvary, I am different than before. When people ask me what had happened, I would tell them, Thanks to Calvary, my life is changed. So I pray that as we celebrate the Father's Day weekend, we value and cherish His fatherhood. And if you're ladies, support your fathers, your husbands, so that we can be a good team together when you are now this Raising your children, the, the most precious blessings that God has given you.